I'll, I'll start by making my usual apologies. Um, six months ago, I became the national spokesperson of an organization, not knowing that I had to speak English to, uh, to, to have this function. So I, I had to learn my English being a spokesperson of, of our national student union. And that, as, as consequence, that I can, I think, pretty coherently talk about new, neoliberalism but I am particularly uh, uncomfortable to order in a restaurant. So, <laughs> so I just want to begin by apologizing maybe if my accent is a little bit uh, rough, but I'll try to be uh, understandable for uh, everyone. Uh, I, I'll then obviously thank uh, for the invitation. Uh, this is the third stop of a, a pan-Canadian conference tour called the Maple Tour and the organizer, Mr. Ethan Cox, that is right here, wants me to remind you that he wants me to remind you that the hashtag of the tour is hashtag Maple Tour if you want to join us on Twitter. And uh, so that's our third stop. We were in York. It's, it's our fourth stop, in fact. We were in York earlier today. We, we had a little discussion yesterday in Toronto. We were in London and we're heading tomorrow for Saskatoon and Regina in the same day. Uh, so we're doing seven cities in uh, seven days, and the, the objective of this tour is really to share the experience of the Quebec students and to see how our experience can inspire social movements, particularly the student movement all around Canada. Uh, I'll uh, start by making a much general context of what was this tuition increase, in what political context was it uh, was it part? And then I'll try to briefly, I have only 15 minutes, to try to make something like a, por a, a portrait of the Quebec student movement. What is, why, and I try, I will try to answer this question that is always asked to me wherever I go to talk about our movement, and this question is obviously, how did the Quebec student movement realize a so massive mobilization. Uh, but first, I just wanted maybe to put the, to put the table for today's uh, panel to remind that the tuition increase that was announced was a pretty historical one. It was announced in uh, the budget of 2010-2011 uh, by the former finance minister of Quebec, which name was Raymond Bachin. And it was, an, it was a pretty massive increase. We're talking about a 75% tuition increase over five years. And uh, Mr. Bachan, when he announced, when he deposed that budget, he said to a Montreal newspaper something I find very, very interesting to understand the context of our strike. He said, this budget will be a cultural revolution. And for a liberal minister, it can seem pretty funny that he uses this kind of expression. But he really said that, and a few times. My budget will be a cultural revolution. And if I always begin by reminding that, is that I find it really instructive on the fact that when the minister says that, in fact, he recognizes that the whole idea of his budget, in fact, that the measures that are in his budget are not financial measures. They're not economic decisions. They are ideological measures, they are cultural measures, like he says it himself. Uh, and he was right. Probably the only time I will say that, but he was totally right. <laughs> he was right. That budget was a cultural re revolution. It, it contained this massive tuition fee increase, but it also contained the first user fee uh, measure in the history of the health system in Quebec. That was called the health tax. It, it was a $200 tax per year per citizen to have access to the health system. It can seem a small amount, $200, but when you install this measure, then you can rise it. One of the first uh, moves of the new PQ government was also to abolish this tax under student pressure. And But what is clear is that in this budget, you had the tuition increase, you had this health tax, and you had also a series of measures of privatization of all public services. And, and it's, re it's really important to understand that 
our strike was done in that context of a budget that was not only attacking students, but that was also attacking workers, women, and, uh, and especially the middle class. So that's really kind of a really, really brief overview of what was the political context of this announcement of a tuition increase. I won't go into all the arguments that we had against the tuition increase. I, I think I'm not wrong if I say that I'm in a pretty sympathetic audience, so I won't I won't explain why we were against. I think we're all against uh, tuition increase here, and we, we all think education should be accessible and should be free. So I will just maybe try to answer that famous question that is always asked to me when I went in Vancouver a few months ago. I went to France also to talk about the movement. And everywhere, the same question always comes back. Why is the Quebec student movement so effective in mobilizing? Uh, and this question is, the mo is most of the time divided in three questions. The first would be how the student movement is able to mobilize, on a quantitative point of view, so much people. We had huge, very huge protests, the, the, the biggest protest probably in the history of the country. Uh, the second question is, al is, is always, uh, and how did you manage that this mass movement had also a very uh, general and systemic discourse? It was not only a mass, movement, a mass movement for a specific issue. This mass movement, this strike, this student strike, began, uh, became also a popular struggle. That's, um, that's often the second question. And the third one is, how did you manage to have active support by a good part of, of the population? I think I could not honestly say that we had the majority of the population behind us. But the part that was supporting us was supporting us strongly and actively. They were with us in the street. They were hidden by the police with us in the street. They were really doing this strike with us. So I think really, uh, I don't pretend to have the answers to that to, to those three questions, but I think I could find two elements that I think might explain partially those success. The first one is uh, really simply the structure of the Quebec student movement. Uh, in my opinion, the Quebec student movement has arrived in 2012 to a perfect match between two things, that would be democracy and structure. Democracy because the Quebec student movement is really uh, as a strong culture of democracy, of direct democracy. Uh, like my colleague will explain it in further details, since we began mobilizing two years before the strike, each step of the struggle was planned, decided, and executed by the student uh, in the student associations. Uh, obviously, there are elected members in our student associations on the local and on the national level. But the strategies, the action plans, everything is decided by the students that are reunited in general assemblies. Uh, during the strike, we had in each of, of our association one general assembly per week. And a few thousand people were there in, in, the, in, in, the, in the biggest association. So we had really a, demo a direct democracy system that was actually working. And it was working during the strike, because before the strike, even between our strike campaigns, we still have this, this reflex of having frequent general assemblies. And the members feel at all times that they control the movement from the beginning, when we signed the first petition against the tuition increase, to when we took the decision to, to make civil disobedience and to broke a law. Those are two very different decisions, but they were taken by the same people. They were taken by the students in their general assemblies. And this, this culture of democracy is, I would say, nourished by another culture that, and it will look very simple to say that, but a very strong culture of work. Uh, student activists in Quebec and I, when I go all around the world, I realize that I have this culture of hard work. That means to build this strike, it, it, it meant that you know, thousands of young activists woke up very early every morning for two years, distributed a monstrous, monstrous uh, amount of flyers, newspapers, uh, I, I can give you only one example. It's only an image, but I think sometimes those kind of images are good. Uh, there is this, there is, uh, in my student association in human sciences in UCAM, there is this big printer. 
And in the two or three months before the strike, this one printer for this one student organization printed 100,000 uh, uh, paper like that, 100,000 in only two or three months. And they had to buy another one because it was, it, was, it was finished. And so obviously it's only an image, but it gives you an idea of the amount of energy and of sweat that has been put by those thousands of activists in order to finally arrive to a non-general, to a general unlimited strike. And, uh, and I, it, it can look very simple, but it's probably the most important part. If you have democratic structure, but you have no, you don't have this core of activists current, constantly working in order to make them function, your general assemblies will be frequent, but they will be empty. And if you want to fill, fill them up, you got to have this this culture of work. And I will just a little parenthesis here to talk about uh, this new thing for our generation that is social media. And I think a lot of activists these days, especially from my age, think that social medias can be a way to mobilize and to mobilize without going out and seeing people, without printing newspapers and flyers and going to distribute them to their fellow students. Uh, Facebook and Twitter may be able to inform people that there is a protest coming on, but they will never convince them to go at the protest, and that's very important. The social medias, they add a very, they, they add a part in, in this huge and beautiful movement that we had, but they, they played their part when the, when the strike was already began. When there was already those hundreds of thousands of people in strike, social medias was a tool for them to organize themselves autonomously from student structures. But but social medias would never have convinced them to vote for the strike. That was obtained by going to talk one student at a time. I remember in 2009 when we began this mobilization, I would say approximately between 10 and 15 percent of the students that we met on the campuses were actually against this tuition increase. Majority of them, the vast majority, were in favor of it. But for two years, we went to talk sometimes for hours which with, with every student in our, in, in our local associations, one after the other. And then two years after, we succeeded in winning our strike votes. But that was only because there was this strong culture of work that was living in our student associations. Uh, and this, th this culture of really constantly, go constantly going to the members and constantly consulting the members on the decisions is also effective because there is an orga uh, organizational structure that gives power to the decisions that are taken, taken democratically by the students. Uh, our, 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 you know, the, one of the things that is said about student strike and about class is that it was kind of a ultra decentralized thing where there was no really decision-making process and it was, you know, totally autonomous groups everywhere in Quebec, like rising from time to time. No, this strike was, there was a certain amount of centralization that was necessary to really have a national strategy in order to make sure that the strike would begin and would, and, and, and would grow. But this, and, and, and we have, like Chloe will explain it in, in further details, this all very stru structured process of decision making that make that, yes, we were really democratic, really close to our members, but we had also the organizational power to make their decision uh, public in the media and, and, and real in the street. And I think it's this perfect match between demo this democracy and this organizational structure that is one of, well, probably the first key of our success. And the result of that, the result of that perfect match between democracy and structure is that in Quebec, a lot of students see their student association like their uh, first political vehicle, like their natural political vehicle. A lot of students see their student association as their voice. In, the, in, in, the, in, the, in Quebec's public debate, in Quebec politics. They feel a lot more represented by their student union than by their MP or any political party. And that is because the movement is close to them, is democratic, and they feel they're really controlling it and that they're part of, someone, of, of, of something. They're not a soldier answering to a general. The second element 
that I would point out to try to explain the success of, of our mobilization is the fact that I think we succeeded this year, class succeeded in being able to articulate two different levels of demand. Because uh, when you look at our slogan, it's really simple. It's together, stop the hype. There's no more simple and direct slogan than that. But at the end of the movement, at the end of the strike, uh, it was probably the, the slogan that was less said in the street. Because the movement had, uh, had grown so big, it had embraced so many causes and movements and ideas and values, that it had really become, I think, a strike uh, that was opposing neoliberalism in general, and not only the specific tuition increase. But still, this shift from a student strike to a popular struggle was made possible by the fact that there actually was a massive student strike. And we were able to mobilize so much students, I think, because we were able to have a very concrete and pragmatic demand that was, let's now stop the hike. Because going in, in strike for students is a big sacrifice. And I am, on, I, am, I am certainly not sure that students would be ready to do all those sacrifices against an idea. I don't think uh, 200,000 students would go on strike against a concept or uh, an abstract idea. People go on strike when they have the face into a concrete injustice and when they, have, and when they know and when they're, they're convinced that they can actually block it that it's, re it's possible to obtain what we are demanding. And, and uh, the, 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 the good argument that we have in Quebec to convince the students about that is that we actually have a history of victories in the student movement by going on strike. And obviously, that's a pretty convincing argument in a lot of cases. But still, what we were able to do this year is to say, OK, we have a very precise demand. It's block the hype. Ensemble bloquons la hausse in French. And everyone knew that the strike had this really concrete and specific objective. But still, as a student organization, we have a project for Quebec that is free education. And we didn't want it to you know, throw, throw up that, that idea because it may seem too exaggerated. So what we did is make clear with the students that the strike was against the hike, but that we would, we would take advantage of this mobilization to talk about free education and to talk about free education whenever we had the opportunity to talk about it. And that's what we did. We were able really to articulate an immediate demand with a more uh, general, systemic, anti-neoliberal discourse. And I think that it's, it's a trap for a lot of social movements to go too much on one side or too much on the other. Uh, we see, for example, labor unions that have a lot of difficulty to mobilize because their only focus is on really corporatist, small demand for their own membership. And that, that corporatism obviously blocks any perspective of turning their strike into a political movement because the demands are so limited, it, it, the, 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 uh, the potential of popular mo mobilization behind their demand is inexistent. But on the other end, there is also a temptation from some activists to, to want to start a strike against something very big. I have heard uh, student activists in English Canada tell me, how did you manage to start a strike against new li neoliberalism? And I'm like, well, you know, it's not really how we convinced people to go on strike. <laughs> And, and, and that it, it seems funny, but it's really important, you know. Uh, I like to quote a philosopher that said, impatience is not an argument. And I think it's a very interesting quote to understand how we, pro how we proceeded in Quebec, re really step by step, and by being able to be, I think, and it's obviously my personal opinion, on the line, and with this perfect tension between, between our immediate demand and our long-term project of society. So, I'll hand here and I'll pass the, the mic to my colleague Chloe, who's the, who uh, is going to maybe go in further details about really the nuts and bolts of our mobilization. I think it's, it's really on that point that we want to focus uh, for this tour because 
I think we don't have to convince anyone that we were fighting for the right thing. I think our duty, and I think it's really a duty as, as Quebec activists is really trying to share our experience and, and to, if possible, plant the seeds of something, uh, something uh, similar in the rest of Canada. Maybe it's going to be on tuition increase. Maybe it's going to be on Stephen Harper. Uh, who knows, but uh, let's hope it just happens.